Today we're in chapter 15 in the Gospel of Luke. We're going to be looking at verses 1 through 10. So let's read verses 1 through 7, and we'll get into our study tonight. Luke chapter 15, beginning at verse 1, reading to verse 7. Luke writes, Then all the tax collectors and the sinners drew near to him to hear him. And the Pharisees and scribes complained, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. So he spoke this parable to them, saying, What man of you having a hundred sheep, if he loses one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one which is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. I say to you that likewise there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 just persons who need no repentance. Well, one of the things I was thinking of, and by way of introduction, a, uh, a little story, this really is something that emphasizes God's desire, this story, the stories that we're going to be looking at, God's desire for people who are lost to be found. And throughout the Bible, you see that God is the God who seeks those who are lost. He has a desire to reach out and to seek those who are lost. You see that from the very beginning. You see it in the book of Genesis when Adam falls. And you see that it is not Adam who is seeking out the Lord. It's not Adam that is searching for God at the fall. I would remind you that it is God who is seeking out Adam. Adam and his wife Eve actually are hiding themselves from the presence of God there in the Garden of Eden. They fashioned for themselves fig leaves and were hiding behind them, their own works, if you will, when they heard the voice of the Lord God there in that garden. And the Bible tells us very clearly that Adam was called to by the Lord. For the Word of God says that, that God called and said, Adam, where are you? And in that call, you see the, the heart of a, of a father, a brokenhearted father, who has lost a child that is dear to him. That's the cry that you find in, in God right from the very beginning. Adam, where are you? Is not the voice of an arresting officer. Adam, where are you? Is the voice of a brokenhearted father who has a child that is lost and he's calling out with a broken heart so that that child might, might be found. When my daughter Corinne, who is now 30 years old, when my daughter Corinne was about a year and a half, Marie and I took her to the store, a store with us, and while we were there at the store, we had placed her down for a moment so that I could look for something on one of the shelves, and Marie and I looked together for something on one of the shelves, and then I looked down for my baby, and she was gone. It only takes a moment for a little baby to toddle off, and she was gone. And I have to tell you, my heart was frozen in my chest, and I had an, just an instant response and I began to just hunt through those aisles for this little one who, who, who wandered away from me. And she was simply around the corner in another aisle there. But I have to tell you, for that instant, for that moment, there was a tremendous fear in me, and there was a cry in my heart, and I began to call out for my baby. And you know, that's what God did when Adam wandered away. God wasn't saying, oh, you're wandering away, that's cool, I hope you fall over a cliff and break your neck, it'll teach you a lesson. That's not what he was doing. What he was doing is he was crying out to him, and, and you see that over and over and over again. The Word of God reveals to us that it is God who calls to us, and he does ask us, where are you? And I have always found it interesting since it was first pointed out to me, how that when you read the Bible in the book of Genesis, and you read not just the words, but you read the punctuation, how interesting it is to see that in chapters 1 and 2 you find a period here or a colon, a semicolon, a comma, whatever, you'll find punctuation. But you never find a question mark in the first two chapters of the Bible. The first question that you find in Scripture actually comes from the mouth of Satan himself when he asks the question of Eve, has God said? And I find it interesting to note that as he says that, as God said, he's questioning God's love, God's compassion, God's keeping power, God's mercy. He's questioning God's word, and he's doing so from the very beginning in the book of Genesis when he asks the question, has God said? And uh, the second question mark that you find is when God says, Adam, where are you? The first question is Satan questioning God's word the second question reflects on the fact that now that Adam has believed the lie, where has that gotten you? 
And so the Bible makes it very clear to us that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and we are lost and wandering aimlessly in this world. And it's God who is the one who pursues us. It's God who seeks us out. And the reason that God does that is because he loves us. It is God's desire to seek for, to find, and then to restore those who have fallen and those who are lost. In Psalm 78, verse 37, speaking of Israel, the psalmist says, Their heart was not steadfast with him, nor were they faithful in his covenant. But he, being full of compassion, forgave their iniquity and did not destroy them. Yes, many a time he turned his anger away and did not stir up his wrath. God's mercy and his compassion is revealed in the fact that he is long-suffering. And the Bible tells us in 2 Peter 3, verse 9, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us word, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And so God's word is very clear that that he loves us and he's not willing to lose us. And God's love, a love that seeks, is most perfectly manifested in the ministry of Jesus Christ. You see, Jesus is revealed in the New Testament as the one who seeks out the lost in order that he might find and in order that he might restore them. In Matthew 18, verse 11, Jesus said, The Son of Man has come to save that which was lost. And John, in 1 John chapter 4, verses 9 and 10, said this, In this the love of God was manifested toward us, that God has sent His only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through Him. In this is love. Not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Not that we first loved him. We love him because he first loved us. And so God first loved us. We were lost. He sought us out. And so what we have in this chapter is a picture of the love of God revealed in Jesus Christ towards us. What we have is a a parable that is given to us in three facets. And we're going to look tonight at the first two. We're going to be looking at the lost sheep and the lost coin. And so what we have here in verses 1 and 2 is an audience. Notice the audience. It says, all the tax collectors and the sinners drew near to him to hear him. There was something about the Lord Jesus Christ that did not cause people who were, who obviously were sinners and had no relationship with God, did not cause them to be concerned about being in his presence. There was something about Jesus that is incredibly attractive, something about the Lord when he actually is present that causes even those hardened individuals to find him winsome, to find something about him attractive. And that's what's taking place here. You have what are called tax collectors, and you have sinners, and they are drawing near now to listen to him. Now, this is an audience that is deemed unworthy by the religious Pharisees. You see, the Pharisees, verse 2, are complaining. The Pharisees and their lawyers, the lawyers being uh, experts in, in the law of Moses or religious law, They're beginning to complain. They're saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them. And so this audience is unworthy, uh, at least to the Pharisees. They would never hang around with these kinds of people because they were the undesirables. They were the outcasts. Now, these are tax collectors and sinners, tax collectors. They used to be hated. Now everybody loves them, right? Tax collectors. Tax collectors during the time of Christ could buy what we would call a franchise, a tax-collecting franchise. And it would entitle them to levy taxes on citizens as well as travelers. And often, tax collectors were extortioners, and they were people who could be bribed easily. Over time, many of these tax collectors had gained great wealth and were very hated by the people because... The Jews hated the fact that they were being governed by Rome, which they knew to be a pagan country. And so a tax collector who was working for these pagans were considered traitors as well as apostates because they were serving pagans and they were making money off of their own people. And so taxes, as they were being levied, actually had a set standard, but the tax collectors were capable of saying, I'm going to add a little bit of that for myself. And so they would give to Rome the accepted tax, 
but any profit they would keep for themselves. And the Jewish people hated them because these tax gatherers were actually gaining on the people's misery, and they hated them for that. Now, sinners were simply people of poor reputations. These were those who did not live according to the law of Moses. And again, Pharisees would normally have nothing to do with them. Remember in chapter 5 here in the Gospel of Luke, verses 29 and 30, how it said, Levi, which is another name for Matthew, that Levi gave Jesus a great feast in his own house, and there were a great number of tax collectors and others who sat down with them, and their scribes and the Pharisees complained against his disciples, saying, why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? This is an ongoing problem. They can't stand the fact that Jesus actually hangs around with sinners. These were the people, though, who were gathering together to listen to him speak. And there was something about Jesus that made them very comfortable. There was something about him that made them feel that they could listen to him. There was something about him that made them realize that he wouldn't turn them away. And so they would come and they would eat with him, undoubtedly would ask him questions and a variety of other things. Now, the Pharisees, in verse 2, the Pharisees and scribes complained, saying this man receives sinners. Now, uh, earlier I just read to you, they had found fault with the disciples for eating with them, but now they're taking issue with Jesus himself. Now, notice how it says, he receives sinners and eats with them. The word receive means to accept into companionship, to not reject. To receive means to accept warmly and lovingly. Jesus is being attacked because he's a friend of sinners. And the neat thing about him is he still is. He still is a friend of sinners. He still is available. If he were not a friend of sinners, then, then we wouldn't be saved today. But he is a friend to us. And, and, and he is somebody who is accessible to us. And so, as Jesus is watching the Pharisees and the scribes complaining and all, saying that this is a man who welcomes sinners and even eats with them, Jesus begins to minister to them. And so it says in verse 3, he spoke this parable to them, saying, what man of you having a hundred sheep, if he loses one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one which is lost until he finds it? Now, I want you to notice something with me here. I want you to see that what you have is Luke saying he spoke this parable to them. To him, to them. Now, I want you to note that because what you have in chapter 15 is actually a series that some have counted as three parables. You have the parable of the lost sheep, the parable of the lost coin, and then you have the parable of the lost son. In reality, I want you to notice something, and I find it interesting. I want you to notice how Luke said he spoke this parable to them. Now, if he's speaking this parable, that tells me that this is one parable, but it has three facets to it, three dimensions. And so what you're going to gain by looking at chapter 15 is actually an insight into Christ from three different angles. Today, we're going to look at the first two. We're going to look at the, the lost sheep and the lost coin. But next time we get together, we're going to look at the parable of the lost son. It's been called the parable of the lost son, but in reality, it's the parable of the lost sons because there are two sons that are spoken of in that particular portion of this parable. But that's what we're looking at. We're looking at one parable given in three sections. And so each one of these sections is intended to reveal something about Jesus Christ to the Pharisees. You see, the Pharisees are complaining that he's a friend of sinners. The Pharisees are complaining that he actually receives them, that he's warm to them, that he doesn't reject them. They have a real problem with this. And so Jesus has to teach them something about the love of God, the God who searches the, and seeks until he finds the lost, and that's what he's doing here. So he gives an illustration relating to a man who had 100 sheep. And so what you have here is 100 sheep, and he loses one of them. But what does he do? Well, Jesus says he leaves the 99 in the wilderness and goes after the one that's lost. So what we have here is, in the first picture is a picture of a good shepherd, a good shepherd who seeks after lost sheep. Now, every good shepherd would search exhaustively until he found the sheep that is lost. And interestingly enough, the Lord Jesus Christ is being portrayed here as that good shepherd, which is something he refers to himself later on in the Gospel of John as being. But he is a shepherd. In Ezekiel, in, in chapter 34, verses 11 and 12, uh, Ezekiel writes, this is what the Lord says. I myself will search for my sheep and look after them. As a shepherd looks after his scattered flock when he is with them, so will I look after my sheep. 
I will rescue them from all the places where they were scattered on a day of clouds and darkness. So God portrays himself as the one who seeks and searches out the lost. That's why Psalm 23 is so powerful when he says, the Lord is my shepherd. So there's this sense of relationship that the sheep and the shepherd have. A shepherd and sheep relationship is one, when the shepherd is a righteous or good shepherd, is one of devotion and concern from the shepherd's part towards the sheep. And so this sheep here is lost. Now obviously the lost sheep is a picture of a lost sinner. This is somebody who is following their own heart. And as they've been following after their own heart, they've wandered away. They're not considering their course of life. They're simply wandering through life. Now, that's a, an adequate picture, I think, of people without the Lord. If you take notes, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 and 2 goes along with this. Because when Paul was writing to the Ephesians in chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, he said to them, You he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. When he says, in which you once walked, that word walked there in Ephesians chapter 2 is where we, we, we actually would translate it, you walked aimlessly or without purpose. Another way to say it is how you meandered through life. You just went from one thing to another is the point that Paul was making, and that's what Jesus is speaking about. He's speaking about a sheep that just is wandering aimlessly through life. No purpose, no direction. Moving from one thing to another, trying this for a while, then moving to that. Moving on, moving on, moving on, never settling on anything. And the further they wander, the further away they are from the shepherd. And before you know it, they are hopelessly lost. This is one of those little sheep that was part of a group that wandered off from the group. And, and the shepherd, who knows them by name, looks over his flock and tends it and notices that one of them has wandered away. So he knows that that sheep is in danger because sheep cannot do anything to protect themselves. I mean, when's the last time you went by a guy's fence and it said, beware of sheep? I mean, sheep are not something that you're afraid of. They cannot defend themselves and all. And so, this is a helpless little animal that is out there wandering around. And so, it's a picture of somebody who wanders through life growing more and more lost and in more and more danger. It's like we were before we came to Christ. That's the whole picture here. Didn't even know you were lost thinking you were having a great time, trying some of this for a little while, and it didn't satisfy, drinking from this well for a little while, and it didn't satisfy, moving on, moving further, further away, and deeper into sin, to the point that you got, like me probably, very lost and very hardened to the things of the Lord. And yet, the Bible says that even though the sheep is wandering away, that the good shepherd, this shepherd, chases after him to rescue him. And so this is, is one of those passages that reveals to us the love and tender concern a shepherd has for the lost. It's a picture of Jesus Christ. And what he's doing here is he's illustrating this to the Pharisees. And he's making a point. He's saying, you religious individuals of all people should have an understanding of how painful it is to be lost and separated from God. Of all people, you ought to have a, a soft heart towards these people whom you refer to as, as tax collectors and sinners, when in reality, you're no better than they are. You're just as lost as they are. And if you really had a relationship with God, you wouldn't object to me ministering to this person. You would rejoice that I am. You would be glad that somebody is caring for these people. We have members of our fellowship right now who go into Ontario on a weekly basis and they go to that area that is called the tent city and they do ministry there. They minister to the people there. They bring them food. They bring them clothing. They gather to them together for Bible studies and they give the word of God to them and they do that every week. These people in our fellowship who have a heart for the lost they're doing the work of ministry amongst people that some complain about because they're there and ought not to be. And what you end up with is people like the Pharisees who get so upset because this is going on, even Christians, and not realizing that this is a group of people that give to us great opportunity to reach 
and to talk to them about the love of God and to encourage them and help them and to serve them, which is what the church is supposed to be doing anyway, isn't it? That's what we've been called to do, you see. And so Jesus is speaking to the Pharisees and he's saying to them in this parable that he has come to seek and to save the lost. And while you are so righteous, he's saying to them, and so separated, you don't even have an understanding of what it means to reach into somebody's life and actually get, get dirtied up by it, if you will, in the sense of being there alongside of them and caring for them. You don't understand at all. So what is happening is he's portraying himself as the shepherd seeking for the lost. Undoubtedly, as he's going through that wilderness, he's calling out the sheep's name. You see, in John chapter 10, verse 3, Jesus speaking about sheep and shepherd and their relationship says that the sheep hear his voice and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. He says in John 10, 27, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. My sheep know my voice. Sheep actually get to know the voice of the shepherd because the shepherd, when the sheep were born, would oftentimes hold the sheep Sometimes like, a, like, like, uh, like just hovering over as, as, the, as the sheep was giving birth to her lamb. And, and the shepherd very often would take that sheep, that little sheep, and would, would hold it and would bond with it, would speak to that sheep. And then the little sheep would begin to recognize his voice. And he'd even name the sheep. And he'd name it, you know, Lamb chop, you know. No, he'd name, he'd, he'd name it barbecue. No, he'd name, I'm just kidding, of course. But he might have, I don't know. But he would, he would, he would name that sheep and, 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 and he would speak to that sheep. And the sheep, that little lamb, would get to know the shepherd's voice. And that's way, that way when the shepherd would call, like a, like a dog would run to its master recognizing the voice, that little sheep, he could call the name and the sheep would come out of that, that flock and, and would come to the, to the master, would come to the shepherd. And, and that's what he would do. He would bond uh, with his voice. He would bond with his tenderness and, his, and, and concern and all because very often when they were raising uh, a sheep, they, it was not for them to, to eat their meat. It was so that they could harvest their wool. And that's so that many of these became almost like, uh, if you will, um, close to them in, in, in a way a family pet does. But they're very dear. They'd name them. They'd care for them. They'd love them. And if one of them wandered away, he'd be concerned enough to chase after them. And that's exactly what Jesus is speaking about here. And the little sheep would know his voice. And so as it goes out, he continues to search until, as it says in verse 4, until he finds it. In other words, he doesn't give up. And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders rejoicing. And so as he gathers this little sheep, he, he places it on his shoulders because the sheep is exhausted and because the sheep needs to be carried away to safety. Now, I find it interesting to note that the sheep is not looking for the shepherd. And that's because the shepherd wasn't lost. The shepherd is looking for the lost sheep. And when he finds the lost sheep, he gently comforts that sheep and carries it home. Sometimes when people give their testimony, they'll say what their life was like, and it can be very interesting to see how the Lord has worked in wonderful ways in their life to, to bring them to Christ. But I find it interesting how so often I've heard uh, people say, um, and then I found the Lord. Fact is, is the Lord wasn't lost. You didn't find him. It wasn't one of those cosmic hide-and-go-seek things where God says, I'm hiding somewhere and you've got to find me. No, the Bible clearly portrays Jesus as the one who searches us out. We're the one who's wandering away, and it's Jesus who's coming after us. And as he finds that little lost sheep, he gently places it on his shoulders because that sheep is exhausted, possibly injured, and so he protects and cares for it and carries it home. Isaiah 40 verse 11 says, He will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs with his arm and carry them in his bosom and gently lead those who are with young. This gives us a picture of the seeking Savior. This gives us a picture of a shepherd who loves his sheep.
And, and once he's found that sheep, notice verse 6, he calls together his friends and neighbors and he says to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. So he's filled with joy. He wasn't concerned financially. He's filled with joy because the sheep has been found in his safe. And then he gives a party. He gives a party because the sheep that was lost has now been found. Now, the self-righteous Pharisees were not rejoicing that these lost people were coming to Jesus Christ. When I first got saved, ancient history, 101 for you, 37 years ago, as a 20-year-old, long hair, you know, bushy sideburns, round granny glasses, you know, tie-dyed T-shirt, ripped Levi's before you bottom ripped, ripped Levi's, <laughs> barefoot. I would wear slacks and a dress shirt barefoot. I never wore shoes. To this day, I wear shoes on Wednesdays and Sundays. <laughs> I have feet this wide. It's amazing. <laughs> Just never wore shoes. I didn't like to wear shoes, so I was always barefoot. Now I wear, you know, uh, flip-flops and, 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 and that and all. Used to call them thongs, but I won't say that anymore. So flip flops. <laughs> Can't say that. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> you get saved. And 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 people, some 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 Christians had a real problem because the church I went to allowed guitars and drums on the platform there, and they were really upset over that. And they would get angry, and they would call my pastor Chuck Smith names, and, and, and they just thought, there's just no way. There's no way that these, these hippies can actually be getting saved. And they didn't believe our testimony, and that's the truth. They didn't believe us because we were not clean cut. We were not clean cut at all. We were, we were, we were, we looked this, I mean, you get saved, you know, you, you come forward in an invitation and, and when we walked forward, you know, coming forward up the aisle didn't suddenly make us have shoes and, and suddenly our hair was being cut back further, further, further until we looked like a jock. I mean, that didn't happen. I mean, we came walking forward. Sometimes people who were just totally hung over because they had been partying the night before, sometimes they had been loaded just before they got to church. Somebody had invited them. They came. The first time I went to Calvary Chapel, I had a friend of mine say to me, I want you to go to church with me. And, and I kept saying, I don't want to go with you to church. And he said, I want you to go to church with me. And I would argue with him. And I'd say, I don't want to go to your church. And he said, no, you got to come just at least one time. you got to come to church with me. And I, and I said, finally, his name was Bill. I said, finally, Bill, okay, one, I'll go one time just to get you off my back. I'll go with you one time. He says, great, I'll be picking you up at such and such time, 5.30 or whatever. We have to go to Costa Mesa and this and that. I went from my house across the street to a neighbor's house. And uh, while I was there, I was drinking beer with them. And while I was there, I was smoking pot. And I was sitting there getting loaded and drinking, waiting to go to church. The first time I went to Calvary Chapel, I'd been smoking pot and I'd been drinking. And I remember very well just going in with, we used to call it with a buzz on. I'd walked in and I was buzzed and I'm just going, whoa, you know. And I'm sitting there with, in, a, in a small church that, that was built to see two, three hundred people. There were over 500 kids in there and they were all up and down the aisles. They were up on the platform. I remember sitting on the left side of the church in the very back and it was so crowded that, that the person behind me would put, they put their knees up so I could lean against them, you know, as I was sitting like that. And I put my knees up and that's how we sat. Hippies didn't really care where you sat. Some of you old folk remember that. We didn't care. Carpet, no carpet doesn't matter to me. And so as we were sitting, I was loaded and I still remember. And as I walked in, they had these guys up there playing music. And, and the first thing I remember about that as I walked in is I thought, man, you know, this is, this is different than what I'm used to. I'm not used to hearing this. I'm used to hearing something entirely different, and it really caught me off guard. And to see all of these young people, they're 18, 19, 17, 21, all around my age, to see all these young people was really kind of like revolutionary. And, and then as I'm just there, and, and they're playing this music, I, I still remember one of the songs they sang, which was, at that time, it was, uh, Someone Really Loves You, Guess Who? 
You know, that was a song that I was familiar with from being played on the radio during the 60s and all. Somebody, and then they said, in his name is Jesus. And, and I remember that, hearing that, and I thought, well, that's kind of cool, you know, throw Jesus in there. And I was not saved. I just thought, well, that's creative. That's cool. It's not offensive to me. I enjoyed it, you know. And then they give the invitation, and then somebody asked me, do you want to go forward? And I, I, at that point, I said, no, no, I'm already a Christian. And there I was. I was drinking and smoking pot. And, and I'll tell you, you know, I was caught so off guard. I mean, I remember so well all these kids around me, and I'm thinking, this, this, is, a, this is weird. You know, I actually like it. But I'm, because I thought that if I walked in there, you know, drinking and, and loaded, I was sure they would kick me out of the church because the church that I used to go to, they would definitely have kicked me out. And so I figured that if I go in like this, barefooted, long hair, buzzed, I, I was sure that what was going to happen was somebody was going to walk me out and say, don't come back again. And I was going to be able to tell the, my friend who invited me, see, you're all a bunch of hypocrites. You're all the same. You guys just, you know, I, I was waiting to do that. You can't imagine what I felt like, because I'm thinking they're going to see this hippie kid in there, long hair and all of that. When I saw the Bible study teacher, his name was, Lon was Lonnie, he was freakier looking than I was. And you can't imagine that, how I looked at this freak and I said, whoa, you know, I don't trust this place. I like it. I mean, it was just too, it was, but that's what Jesus calls us to do, you see. Now, that was 37 years ago. I'm 57 years old now. I never want to forget what it was like at the age of 20. And that's why if you want to come in here with piercings up and down your face, you set off metal detectors every time you walk through, you know, to get on a plane. I don't really care. I really, really don't. If you want to be tatted up and down, all that's between you and the Lord. I'm not going to make an issue over that. You know, we had a kid in our church who used to put, he'd take eggs and he'd put them in his hair and then spike it out so it looked like a giant spider. And you could see him from the back and his hair was like this long and it was just point after point, you know. And, and uh, he wanted to freak us out. And, and you can't freak me out. You can't freak out a freak, you know. And I, I <laughs> you know, been there, done that. Come on, you know. It, 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 it doesn't do anything to me. You know, I, I, I wonder if it might hurt. But other than that, you see, the Lord Jesus Christ is a fisherman. And fishermen only clean the fish after they catch them. And there's so many people who are trying to clean up fish. You know, Jesus cleans the fish up after he catches them. And if, and, and if, he want, if this person gets saved and they want to have their hair like that and they want to have those piercings, that's between them and the Lord. I don't get into those arguments. I've had people who've, who've asked me in the past, you know, Pastor, what about all those tattoos and aren't they demonic and this and that? And I said, man, you know, come on. Come on. I have a friend of mine who's a pastor. And uh, he has a tattoo on his arm of a woman. And he called me up and he said, Pastor, he says, you know, because he's, he's one of my sheep who's planted a church. He said, Pastor, he goes, I just was thinking, you know, I'm trying to teach the Word of God and I've got this naked woman on my arm. What should I do? I said, draw a dress on her, man. I mean, wh <laughs> what else can you do? You know, put a dress on her. <laughs> I'm just serious. I'm not kidding. I, I put a dress on her, man. You know, what else can you do? Let's not, get, let's not get trippy and weird. L let's not become self-righteous. And, and you know what? We haven't. You know, we haven't. On occasion, I have somebody who's new to the fellowship saying, how come, you know, you got all the piercings and, and you know, ask them. Why ask me? You know, it's not, that's not something I'm concerned about. You know, because man looks at the outer appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. And if this person who's all tatted up can speak to another kid who's all tatted up, more power to him. And if, and if he can reach them for Jesus Christ, bless God. What am I supposed to say? You know, and get them all removed so you can be... You know, when I got saved, there was a church. This is the truth. I could name the church. I won't. There was a church that had a barber on staff. So when the hippies came forward, they'd go forward to pray and they'd take them in the back and cut their hair off because everybody knows that Jesus had a crew cut. And it just amazes me. It amazes me how we turn people away because we just don't like how they look. They just don't fit in to our idea of what a Christian is. 
The self-righteous Pharisees were not rejoicing that these sinners were being saved. And so Jesus speaks to them. In John chapter 9, verses 40 and 41, Jesus said, For judgment I have come into this world, that those who do not see may see, and that those who see may be made blind. Some of the Pharisees who were with him heard these words and said to him, Are we blind also? Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would have no sin. But now you say, We see, therefore your sin remains. You think you see when you don't, and you are hardened in your blindness. They would not rejoice that Jesus was actually bringing people like tax gatherers and sinners into the kingdom of God. He was the one who was gathering these sinners on his shoulders and rejoicing and inviting people to rejoice with him, but they wouldn't. And so he says in verse 7, I say unto you that likewise there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 just persons who need no repentance. There is joy in heaven, and God rejoices when the lost are found. There is joy, and he wants to share it. And who's the one who wants to share the joy? The owner of the sheep. Now, there are 99 whom he refers to as just persons who, he says, need no repentance. Now, these are not truly righteous people. These are 99 self-righteous people. These were the people that society respected, but they were still lost. These were the Pharisees. These were the ones who were well, who didn't know that they needed a physician. Because I've discovered something. As a lost sinner who has been found, I can now rejoice with the Lord when another lost sinner is found. And I do rejoice. That's why when we have invitations and, and people come forward to say, I, I need to be right with God, that's why we as a church will applaud. We applaud because we're rejoicing because along with God, we are glad to see people getting right with God. And, and, and anybody who's been saved can rejoice when you see somebody else saved. And so he speaks here concerning a lost sheep. And then in verse 8, he speaks of a lost coin. He says, Or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp, sweep the house, search carefully till she finds it? And when she has found it, she calls her friends and neighbors together, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the piece which I lost. Likewise, I say to you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. This is the second part of the parable, a woman and her lost coin. He says this woman has ten coins, but notice she loses one. Instead of saying, well, I've got nine other coins, she begins searching for the one that has been lost. The reason why she does that is because its value to her is not necessarily monetary. During this time, married women had a headdress that was made of 10 silver coins that was linked by a silver chain. And sometimes a woman would save for years to amass 10 coins. Her headdress was like her wedding ring, and it could never be taken from her, even to pay off a debt. This headdress of 10 coins had tremendous value to her. And so what we see here is how God values you the value that you have to him, that he will search for you. So in her dark home, she lost her coin, but she diligently searches for it. And so this is a picture of Jesus searching for us until he finds us. We're like a lost coin. And the longer that coin is lost, it becomes covered with dust, and it becomes useless. As a matter of fact, it is useless until it's found. And the longer a coin is lost, the less probability is there of it being found. It's not real difficult to encourage a child to have faith in the Lord. It really isn't that difficult. You just every day encourage them to pray and talk to them about Jesus, and, and you impart to them, to a receptive and innocent heart, a realization of the God that had created that child. It's not difficult to encourage a child to have a faith in God. It really isn't. But if that child is neglected and no encouragement to that child is given for that child to have a relationship with the Lord, as they grow older, they become harder. 
And as they become harder and harder to the things of the Lord, that as they grow older and older, it becomes somewhat more and more miraculous, if you will, when they actually get saved. It's been said there's no sinner like an old sinner. And when people are hardened in sin, you know, they'll say, well, I used to believe, but I don't anymore. The longer a coin is lost, the more dust accumulates. It has no value. And so what he does, it shows his, the value he places on you by searching diligently for you because of the value he has placed on you until he finds you. She even lights a lamp. She, she sweeps the house. She searches diligently until she finds it. She's looking for something of value that has been lost. And as a result, when she finds it, again, there's great joy. In verse 9, it says, When she found it, she calls her friends and neighbors together, saying, Rejoice with me, I have found the peace which I lost. This piece of great value to me that I, that I cared about, rejoice with me for I have found it. Now, I want you to see verse 10. Likewise, I say to you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. I find this interesting, and I want to point something out to you. I want you to see how he says there is joy in the presence of the angels of God. In other words, there's joy in front of or before the angels of heaven. Who is rejoicing? You know, sometimes I have heard uh, people say the angels are rejoicing. Well, interestingly enough, salvation is something that angels desire, according to 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 12, angels desire to look into. In other words, they, they exert themselves to gain a better perspective of salvation. And, and the holy angels are actually struck with astonishment at the plan of human redemption. You see, angels cannot be saved once they fall. I've had people ask in the past, can Satan repent? And the answer is he doesn't. Can fallen angels repent? The answer is they never do. They remain fallen for eternity. So those that remain unfallen, the unfallen angels, don't understand salvation. They want to peer into it. They want to understand the plan of redemption. But they don't understand it because they don't partake in it. God, who initiates salvation, is the one who rejoices because he's the one who searched diligently for the lost and rejoices when he finds. And thus, the angels will see God rejoicing over the lost who was found, which means that... God rejoiced when you were found and that the angels were witnesses of God's joy when you said yes to Jesus Christ. Now, the angels, in that they don't experience salvation, don't have that personal experiential knowledge of that. They're aware that God is the Savior. They're aware that God saves. They're aware that God sent His Son Jesus to save, but they never experienced that. And so God, who is the one who initiates salvation and pursues until he finds, rejoices, and so do we, because we have been found also. So we can rejoice along with the Lord God. Now, in what Jesus is saying, it's very simply, God rejoices over the lost being saved, but self-righteous and self-satisfied people never do. The Bible tells us in Psalm 47, 1, clap your hands, all you people. Shout to God with a voice of triumph. And when people are saved, that's what we're doing. We're, 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 we're praising God and we're shouting with a voice of triumph because God has conquered. God has, has worked through. He reached somebody who had wandered away and was dead in sin and in trespasses. He reached this person who was, was the walking dead, dead man walking, if you will, somebody who was alive yet not spiritually alive. Somebody who was what the Bible calls a sinner. Somebody who was, who was not pursuing God. Somebody who was lost, who had missed the mark. 
but through the gospel of Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit's activity when the message is preached and, and, and you heard the message in a personal way and you said, that's me. I'm a person like that sheep. I've wandered away. I don't have a relationship with God. You mean God is pursuing me? God is following after me? God is looking for me? You mean God will rejoice when he finds me? And the answer is yes. And when you say yes to Christ, God forgive me a sinner. I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. I believe he died on the cross for my sin. I believe that he, he was in a grave for three days and that you resurrected him. I believe he ascended to heaven. I believe that, and I want to personally acknowledge that. And when you do, and you're born again, when the Holy Spirit comes and dwells within you through faith in Christ, and you are now a new creation, old things pass away, behold, all things becoming new, then we rejoice along with God who has saved you. We didn't save you. God saves you. His Word saves you. His Spirit drew you. So ask yourself today, if you're not a Christian, or even if you're a backslidden or, or a Christian who is living a very carnal life, ask yourself, is this the best that life has to offer to you? Because right now, for a person who doesn't know the Lord, you may be complaining about how things are, and you may be ready to vote for that person who's going to change everything for you. But the bottom line is there's only one who can actually change you, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. Because he works from the inside. And I thought I was a Christian. I was raised by a mom who taught me that there is a God, that there is a Bible, by a mama who who, who prayed, who would pray for me, who wanted me to go to catechism classes, who encouraged me to have a faith in, in God. And yet I didn't have that faith in God. I, I, I was like you, the lost sheep, wandering further and further and further away, hurting and hurting and hurting others all along the way. Didn't even realize how bad off I was I was the blind who thought I could see. And here comes the Lord, slowly but surely, pursuing until he finally, with cords of love, drew me to himself, to the preaching of the gospel, a message that says God loves the world so much that he gave his son. Now, you could have told me all day long, there is a hell and you're going to go there. And my response at that time would have been, and so are all of my friends, so we'll party. So what? I don't care. I don't care that you say I'm going to hell. And I, and I did say that. I don't care that you say I'm going to hell. What does it matter to me? Who are you to tell me anything anyway? You don't know me. And, and I had this belligerent, antagonistic, angry attitude towards people. Don't tell me there's something wrong with me. Go look at yourself for a while the hypocrisy of this world that we're living in, and you're coming and talking to me? Are you kidding me? You know, I haven't ever seen a real Christian in my life, and you're telling me that you're one? You know what? It's fine for you, but it's not fine for me. That was my attitude. But one day, it finally all came to a head, and finally one day, I woke up to the reality of the fact that I was most miserable. I had no joy. I had nothing but guilt. And I began to condemn myself for the things that I was doing. I finally realized that I'm hurting my family, hurting my mom, hurting my dad, that I'm hurting the girls that I'm dating that, that cared about me that I didn't care for and didn't treat right. And it finally got to the point when I was going crazier and crazier and then almost dying of a drug and alcohol overdose that I finally said, I'm lost. I am absolutely lost. Now, I might not have said I'm a sinner because I really didn't know what that meant, but I did know what it means to be lost. I was most definitely lost. And during that time, it's when I began to cry out to God and I started saying, God, you got to help me. God, you got to help me. And I can still remember as a non-saved person, an un uh, I wasn't a Christian, I still remember that I started going through times where I was saying, God, I need your help. God, I need to change. God, I need your help. I don't know what to do. I went to see my parish priest. I grew up in Norwalk. I went to Santa Fe Springs to go to church. I went to St. Pius X Church. And one of my friends 
was telling me about Jesus. And I went and spoke to my priest. And I said, I want to talk to you for a minute, if I may. I said, one of my buddies is telling me that he's a Christian and that his life has changed. I said, and I'm a Catholic, and, and I would just like to have some answers to give to him. Can you help me? Because I know the Catholic religion is the true religion, but I don't know how to present it to somebody. Can you help me? And I told him, you know, I, I haven't been living a good life. He was a priest. You can confess to him, so I did. I haven't been living a good life. I've been living away from God. I do drugs. I drink. I steal. I lie. I'm an angry person. But I need, to, I need truth. Can you help me? I need truth. And he said to me, well, I've tried the Oriental religions. I tried Buddhism. I tried Hinduism. And I came back to Catholicism, and so will you. That was his answer to me. I'll never forget it. And I looked at him, and I said, that's the answer? He said, yeah, you'll be okay. And I walked out of that room at 20 years of age, and I said to myself, and this is the truth, forgive me if it sounds judgmental, but I thought to myself, if this man knew truth, he'd have given it to me. If he knew what was true, he'd have given it to me because I was asking him to. And at the age of 20, I said, he doesn't know what truth is. And I went out and I went even further down and further down and further down until the shepherd who seeks out the lost sheep until the woman who finds the lost coin finally caught up with me and grabbed me, put me on his shoulders, brought me back rejoicing and said, let's party, let's party. The one that was lost has been found. And that's when I was 20 years old when I gave my heart to Jesus Christ. And no looking back, no turning back, God has been faithful all along and he rejoices when he finds that one lost sinner. He rejoiced over me, and he'll rejoice over you.